Hello and welcome to Climate Culture, the Art of Becoming Sustainable, a series of online and physical events examining the important role cultural organizations can and should play in combating the climate emergency. Climate Culture is curated and produced by Onassis Stegi in collaboration with Julie's Bicycle. My name is Daphne Tragona. I'm a curator and a writer. I'm based in Berlin, and I will be the moderator of uh, this panel, which will address the role of uh, narratives, of climate narratives, looking specifically into the ones emerging through culture, art, and activism. Now, the word narrative uh, is being used in the context of this event to basically refer to how the climate crisis is um, approached and communicated, reaching different people's audiences and publics. And there are, we could say, a couple of uh, narratives one could uh, refer to here. The story of the um, anthropogenic activity on the planet, for instance, of the impact of the so-called human footprint, is, for instance, told through scientific facts, uh, through climate data and reports that expose hard truths and undoubted realities. Weather conspiracy theories, on the other hand, are, are built and shared by climate, climate deniers who contradict or undermine scientific facts and cause confusion. Scenario about the engineering of the planet, a different kind of narrative we could also refer to, or the so-called geoengineering, are often connected to economic interests and are advanced by those who believe that it's possible, that it's desirable, to continuously uh, intervene and to optimize Earth's atmosphere on a planetary scale. So having this in mind, having different uh, narratives in mind, um, and knowing that the climate crisis is, of course, felt um, asymmetrically between and within continents, um, countries, and territories, there are certain questions that could be asked, like who tells the story in each case? Um, whom do these narratives address? Whom do they involve? And um, which of these approaches raise awareness? And uh, more importantly, which of those narratives empower people in provoking change um, on an individual and collective level? So as part of this panel, um, artists and curators are invited to discuss uh, the potential of narratives that still envision a healthier planet, that still help in claiming um, climate justice and fostering agency. So we will hear um, about different artistic and curatorial um, strategies and methodologies, different genres and formats that in a way shape uh, new narratives about how uh, we want to relate to each other and to the surrounding world. Our guests will offer short contributions and a discussion will follow right after. Allow me to um, shortly introduce them to you. Uh, I will do that in the order in which they will speak. Uh, so Jona Stahl is a visual artist whose work deals with the relation between art, propaganda, and democracy. His most recent book is Propaganda Art in the 21st Century, published by the MIT Press. He's the founder of the artistic and political organization, New World Summit, as well as the co-founder of the Court for Intergenerational Climate Crimes, together with writer and lawyer Rada D'Souza. Fivi Yanisi is a poet, an architect, and a professor at the Department of Architecture of the University of Thessaly. Her work lies at the border between poetry, performance, theory, and installation, investigating the connections between language, voice, and writing with body, place, and memory. She is the author of seven books of poetry published in Greek, German, and English. James Bridle is a writer and artist working across technologies and disciplines. Their artworks have been shown in exhibitions worldwide. The writing has appeared in magazines and newspapers, including The Wire, The Atlantic, The New Statesman, The Guardian, and The Observer. James are the author of New Dark Age, published by Verso, and the writer and presenter of New Ways of Seeing, produced by BBC Radio 4. And last but not least, <laughs> Lucia Pietro Justi is a curator working at the intersection of art, ecology, and systems. She's the curator of general ecology at the Serpentine Galleries, London. She was the curator of Sun and Sea, the Lithuanian Pavilion at the 2019 Venice Biennale. And she also is one of the curators of the 13th Sangai Biennale, Bodies of Water, this year. Uh, this is for, uh, all from me. Now we will start with uh, the first uh, presentation by Jonas. 
Thank you, Daphne, for the introduction and to Van Heiste for the invitation. I'm going to share a presentation with you uh, to talk about my research and work on what I call climate propagandas. So climate propagandas research for my end starts with a, with a very simple observation, namely that we might be able to witness the same climate catastrophe phenomena in different parts of the world and to different extents in different parts of the world in the form of toxic wildfires, plastic mega tsunamis, but that the ideological narratives through which these phenomena are inter interpreted are conflicting. So between liberal climate propaganda, libertarian climate propaganda, conspiracy climate propaganda, or eco-fascist climate propaganda, each of these narrates, propagates a fundamentally different interpretation of our present and future world. So in liberal climate propaganda, and then I think, for example, of the recent, the more recent nature documentaries narrated by David Attenborough, the changing climate and its causes tend to be generalized by talking about our consumer behavior. And that then means human behavior. And human behavior is then what supposedly has created the condition for the last desperate polar bear to drown. But soon after, as these documentaries unfold, when it comes to the question of climate action, this generic humanity, this we, is suddenly split into individuals. So we, as individuals, are then told to consume green, to use durable light bulbs, to fly less, as if individual consumer behavior is what caused the climate crisis, rather than the system of racial capitalism. And as a result, liberal climate propaganda essentially declares every extinction for itself. In libertarian climate propaganda, the narrative is different. The climate crisis is even welcomed by libertarians in order to undermine the functioning of the nation state and thus create the conditions for the entrepreneurial class to take over. In this Ayn Rand styled phantasmagoria, extinction is essentially turned into capital. Extinction becomes a new market, a new market for geoengineering, for floating cities, for interplanetary colonization, like the Martian colony envisioned by Elon Musk and his company SpaceX to create a backup planet for the Earth's 0.1 ruling elites to escape the exact same climate catastrophe that they have brought about in the first place. So in libertarian climate propaganda, we encounter a narrative in which extinction becomes nothing but market expansion. In conspiracist climate propaganda, Daphna already mentioned it in her introduction, we encounter the anti-vaxxers, the QAnon followers, the Nazi hippies, and the flat earthers. For the conspiracists, the collapse of our ecosystem is a hoax. It is the Soros Foundation globalists that engineer climate change-induced pandemics and mass vaccination campaigns to keep populations docile and subservient. And this parallel reality is maybe best embodied in the flat earthers anti-globe that you see constructed here by a flat earther activist, a dark age idea for an alt world realized with artisanal precision. It's a denial, not just of climate catastrophe, but the denial of the earth as such. And there is the category of eco-fascist climate propaganda. During the coronavirus pandemic, we have already come to witness the rise of the eco-fascist slogan, humans are the virus, which embodies the claim that the higher growth rate of the global south is the true threat to an inhabitable world. A falsehood that is shamelessly reproduced through films like Planet of the Humans from 2020 produced by Michael Moore. This overpopulation narrative criminally bypasses the fact that it is the excessive consumption and endless extraction of the global north that lies at the heart of ecosystem breakdown. And the eco-fascist narrative is one that enables a gen genocidal logic on who then has the divine right, the racial superiority to survive and who does not in this perspective of overpopulation, management or engineering. Now, of course, understanding and deconstructing these different climate propagandas is not the same as stopping them from having effect. And in this light, I have been working the past years on what I refer to as a form of deep future climate propaganda. An attempt, to, an attempt of propagation of worlds that become possible when we transform with the climate and establish new comradely bonds amongst human and non-human ecosystem workers. 
the parliament that I was commissioned to develop for and with the autonomous government in north in uh, of Rojava in northern Syria that you see in construction here was an important part to that process of articulating this notion of deep future climate propaganda. In Rojava's stateless democracy, the notion of social ecology is an essential pillar, which is literally inscribed into the pillars uh, of the parliament that we developed that you can see here taken into use. The term social ecology describes an ecology of sociabilities and mutual dependencies between human and non-human commune members. A good example might be the famous saying, uh, Kurds have no friends but the mountains. And of course, this refers to the mountain areas in North Kurdistan, in Bakur, from which the Kurds have continued their struggle for self-determination. But simultaneously, this saying, Kurds have no friends but the mountains, affirms the comradely bonds between humans, plants, and animals, between human and mountain, in shared political struggle. This notion of non-human comradeship in social ecology has also been central to the experimental biosphere interplanetary species society that I created in a former underground nuclear facility in Oslo that you can see here. Opposing the idea of interplanetary colonization as proposed by Musk and his libertarian climate propaganda, this alternative biosphere instead seeks to turn intraplanetary. So from interplanetary to intraplanetary, literally deeper within the earth and deeper within time to assemble humans alongside proletarian plants, meteorites and ammonite fossils. The ammonite that went extinct in the fifth mass extinction was a witness to the fifth mass extinction as we are witnessing the sixth. They are fossils. We are fossils in the making and they are, of course, literally the fossil in fossil fuel. And that, of course, also opens a question with regards to this panel and the objective of Onassis Tehi to address climate, the climate catastrophe, considering its reliance on funds from the shipping transport of oil and petroleum. Does Onassis Tehi commit to an immediate push and transition, um, to, to an immediate push for divestment from fossil fuels, or does it partake in the category of greenwashing climate propaganda, which one could consider as a subchapter of liberal climate propaganda. In other words, are fossils comrades or are fossils fuel? It can't be both, so it will have to be a choice between the two. A final example in relationship to this exploration of a deep future climate propaganda is a current work that I'm developing alongside lawyer and writer Rade de Souza that Daphne already mentioned, titled The Court for Intergenerational Climate Crimes, the CICC, that will begin its proceedings in October this year in Amsterdam. So you see a sketch of the site of the tribunal here. The CICC is more than human tribunal where we organize hearings to prosecute climate crimes committed by states and corporations in past, present and future. Here again, <clears throat> humans assemble alongside the earth memories of extinct animals and plants, each termed comrade in a different, sometimes near extinct language. There is, of course, a direct correlation between the extinction of species and the extinction of cultures. They are evidence of climate crimes, but in the court, they are also witnesses to their prosecution. Non-human ancestors that testify to the violated ecologies now assembled with those willing to transform with the climate to propagate a deep future and a biosphere for all. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jonas. And uh, now we will uh, pass the virtual mic over to Phoebe. So <clears throat> my work is uh, uh, in a way the opposite of uh, what uh, we have heard from Jonas. It's based on the, on, uh, the, the, the empathy uh, that one can create with other beings. And that's the way to, to, to touch the subject from my part. So I create chimeric narratives of symbiosis and song uh, on research projects that have to do with place and voice. Uh, so I, I transpose mythical figures and animal poets to writing and voice performance. Animal poets, animals and their voices are studied in order to reappear poetically in installations, books and performances. These last projects I call uh, zoopoetics. Cicadas, the donkey, the goat, the chimera, the nightingale, and the swallow. 
Mythical thought uh, plays a very important role uh, for my work. It introduces empathy for the world, for every living being, because in the myths, everything and everybody has the capacity of speech and the capacity of communication with each other. So it is like every body, every voice. I try to include the other to create a space for polyphony inside the chimeric body in order to resist to the canon, the dominance of logos, more specifically the white male human Western logos that creates a discrimination based on race, economy, differentiation between human beings and other creatures between man and the world, and of course creates the climatic uh, catastrophe. If the ego is nothing less than a here uh, that a certain etymology uh, says to us, then the voice in poetry expresses nothing but this here, yet through the multiplicity of subjects, those others that dwell on this here at that specific moment. So place and language together or language as a place, reading out, the voice encounters the multiplicity of beings that inhabit the place. Every place is polyphonic by definition. I try to recreate this polyphony. I collect the voices of the others and I construct polyphonic assemblage in printed books or poetic installations. The way writing is put into space triggers oral performances. The installations of sound uh, works are a mimesis of Lance polyphony and symbiotic situation. The questions of power and hierarchy uh, that are issued from these projects emerge without giving to them a clear answer. I try to impersonate the other voices, I cover my face and there, there is a question of becoming, becoming animal or becoming human animal. So I will present you two very, two, two big projects that I have done. The one is called Chimera. You see here uh, definitions of the word as a multiple being that is composed by, by multiple parts. And uh, we know the definition that Donna Haraway gives uh, for the today person uh, that uh, is by definition chimeric. And this is a project that has to do with uh, goats and goat uh, transhumans, uh, goat herding in Greece and in an ancient, very ancient practice that uh, is using the moving of the herds uh, from winter uh, that, that they are in the lowlands to summer, they very in a very high place. Here is uh, you have the shepherd. And I tried uh, in this uh, specific work to um, deal with uh, the animal as the subaltern and the female animal as also the subaltern and as a metaphor also for the women's situation or of the situation of uh, persons that are under danger. So here you see a symbiotic condition inside the herd uh, where the, the dogs are uh, licking the milk. But here you see the shepherd who chooses uh, which kids are going to be slaughtered. So we have a double situation where uh, the, the shepherd is the mother of the kids and at the same time is the killer of the kids. And the shepherd is at the same time um, the absolute master for the goats and he is at the same time, uh, he belongs to a minority of blacks that speak another language that was prohibited uh, till now in Greece. And so he also belongs to the subalterns of this world in a way. Uh, I did an, an ethnographic research that uh, it was about three years. And then I started presenting different um, kind of uh, versions of this project that had to do with uh, the archive. I constructed an archive, it's, it's a, a way of working. And in every uh, presentation of the work, um, the, the archive is treated in a different way. So here you have the leather of the animal, which was also used before as a parchment. And on this leather, I used it as a map and I wrote uh, uh, parts of my research, bibliographic references, 
I wrote poems, um, I wrote uh, things that had to do with the map of the animal's body. So uh, it had a way, it had a connection with the body, but also a map that had to do with the moving of the herd. I don't know if you see this red line that uh, cuts across it, and this is the line of the moving. So at the other side of this uh, uh, parchment, uh, you can see uh, the map of uh, the transhumans map, and in this uh, side you see the the world map. And this is uh, something that I wear and I read in performances uh, such uh, as this performance, which took place in, uh, in Athens uh, in 2015, uh, where a lot of people were, um, were, were contributing by reading texts, uh, a polyphonic reading with a musician also. So another project that I did with my uh, partner, this is Kotionis, was called Natural Culture Calling, and it was uh, made at the uh, Vienna North Bahnhof. And uh, it was creating a kind of double situation in, uh, in which uh, the man and the human and uh, the animal uh, are inside. We used this idea of onomatopoeia, uh, where you have a word that is made by the sound of uh, the animal uh, in order to construct a common song, a common song in between animals, birds, and humans. And uh, this situation of shared song and shared words had a counterpart, which was an installation of nests that was a uh, 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 nest for migratory birds, this specific uh, bird uh, on uh, high columns, you will see a small video now that has to do with that. So the installation had uh, uh, this performance where the nests were put on top of the columns of the empty place which uh, was be to become a kind of park. And the question at this Biennale project uh, curated by Elke Krasney and Angelica Fitz was uh, how can we make a prototype of living uh, that had to do with humans and animals together uh, in the center of uh, a new construction area that was the old uh, uh, railway north station of, uh, of uh, Vienna. And this place was a place of passage for birds. So we thought about making nests for birds and uh, at uh, the bottom of the nest, we have seats for humans. And the ornithologist who worked with us, Martin Rizin, he tried, he imitates the words, the, the, the sounds of the birds. And here he is, he sings in the bird language. Uh, in the book that I did on the, on the previous project, uh, I tried to create the polyphony inside the book. So poetry comes together with all the voices that I, I quote. So you can see here a kind of dialogue. And then uh, um, something that uh, uh, I try to, to do often is uh, a kind of reading uh, of spontaneous reading from persons that come to the place. And uh, here we had first the presentation of the book, and then uh, a meal that uh, was uh, offered in the central agora, the meat agora of Athens, in which uh, the supla were pages of the book and everybody was reading parts of the book that had to do with uh, animals' lives. So after this project, uh, there are a lot of projects that I am doing now that have to do with the choral aspect of uh, the multiplicities. How can we understand the multiplicity as a chorus? Uh, which um, a type of life or non-life parts can ad adjust itself to this chorus? 
so the sea is a kind of chorus or uh, the sky is a chorus and for this project uh, the, the animals by, by themselves were the chorus So here I am in a pen in Nisiros and I am reading to the animals after having fed them. So to impersonate others with one's voice has the aim to touch the common point, what is shared in between species, life, being transposed to the other's position. The metaphoric aspect of thought and feeling creates empathy for the world. Thank you. Thank you, Phoebe. Uh, now we will go to James. James, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for having me and to the other participants. I'm enjoying hearing about everyone's practices. Um, so my name is James Bridal. I'm a writer, an artist. Um, and for some time now, I've worked largely uh, in the field of technology, uh, very broadly, but mostly focused on the internet. Um, last 10 years, that's mostly what I've been interested in, uh, although I find myself less and less interested in it today. One of the reasons for that is that a few years ago, I read a book called New Dark Age, in which I explored many of the kind of contradictions that, I, that I've come to see in, in the internet and, and in technological practices more, more generally. Um, I, I guess I started from a position of being very positive about our technologies and about the internet, and that has changed over time. Uh, which is hardly surprising when you look at where we are right now. Um, and I became increasingly interested in the, the impact of the internet uh, on, on, on our wider society, on culture, on politics, and so on and so forth. Uh, in writing New Dark Age, which addressed many of those issues, uh, one of the things that um, it became very obvious and necessary to address was the relationship between technology and the climate. And that became quite a large part of the book. Um, so I was particularly interested in the way the way we have currently developed new technologies, high technologies, network and media technologies impacts the environment uh, in multiple ways. Uh, one obvious way is through, uh, through pollution, uh, through the damage to the earth, through the extraction of various materials, particularly metals, uh, and through air pollution, uh, through the heating and cooling of computers, through really everything we do on computers. Um, for example, the fact that uh, the, the infrastructure of the internet itself. So that's not just your personal computers, but the, the computers that are far away that are running the internet have about the same kind of carbon output, about the same damage to the environment as the entire airline industry. So it's a deep and hidden cost that we don't often see. And it seemed deeply related to the issues of technology that I was concerned about. On top of that, you also have the cognitive effects of technology, the way in which the internet, again, as currently constructed, seems to be warping the way we're even capable of thinking about the world. We think of those conspiracist narratives that Jonas mentioned earlier, those are largely driven by the way we've constructed the internet at present as something that both individualizes people, radicalizes people, and yet also makes them capable of coming together in increasingly large radicalized groups that is actively hampering our ability to address uh, this ongoing crisis. Uh, and I think technology plays a huge, huge role in in both aspects of that, both the direct effects on the planet and on the cognitive effects. In the years since writing that book and, and, and sort of having to, acknowledging that it was necessary to reckon with those particular effects, um, I've largely been looking at the, the relationships between technology and ecology more directly, and particularly on the ways that we can rethink them. Um, because as I said, most of the effects that I note are the result of the way we have con currently constructed our technologies, which of course is also how we've constructed ourselves politically because all questions of technology at sufficient scale are essentially political questions. Um, so you can kind of drop the technology question at a certain point, but it's an interesting way to talk about it. In particular, I've been looking at the ways in which a reconception of technology might actually bring us closer to the world in certain points, to, to reconnect it. Uh, reconnect us to it in precisely the ways it has worked for the last few centuries to, to radically disconnect from us and to actively damage it. Um, I'm particularly interested in questions of how we begin to recognize the more than human world, uh, the reality of the, the multiplicity of beings that we share this planet with and have relationships with, uh, responsibility towards, and also much to learn from. Um, for example, I'm particularly interested in the fact that it's 
precisely in this moment of planetary crisis um, caused by our inattentiveness to the rest of the world that we seem to be hell bent and incredibly excited about the definite about the development of artificial intelligence right these weird little toy machines um, that at the same time are causing a kind of existential crisis for us this, this this ongoing fear that we will somehow be replaced by these things and outmoded by them which is frankly quite likely as they're being developed by some of the worst capitalists on earth but we considered perhaps thought about differently i'm interested in the fact that it's precisely at this moment when we need to recognize the already existence and importance of other intelligences that we're actually creating something that resembles them ourselves and therefore perhaps these technologies that we're developing in multiple ways are actually gateways through which we may be able to move towards the the decentering of the human which is precisely what the ai the development of artificial intelligence is it's the acknowledgement that the human game is not the only one in town and actually open us up to to other intelligences that are already here and surrounding us and that we pay so little attention to and that's true in multiple ways take for example the the discoveries over the recent decades about the um, the communications and interconnections networkness itself of of ecologies and of forests in particular uh, these things that are being revealed to us as in part information networks obviously far far more than that um, living uh, agential beings but ones that we're also capable of seeing because we had to develop our own networks first we we were unable to see these extraordinary networks in nature before we developed ways of thinking about them through the development of networks like the internet. So I think there's really fascinating, intense connections between the, between the possibility of technology massively reconsidered as to what it's actually for and, and the new narratives we need to inscribe in order to rethink our relationships with the planet. Um, much of that is the subject of my next book, which is coming out next year. But as a result of, of thinking about that and thinking through it, um, it's allowed me to, to rethink what it is my own work does, as well as my writing. I also make, make artworks that for the last decade or so have been quite specifically about the, the nature of technology and kind of critiques of it in certain ways. I've become increasingly convinced that uh, really the, the, the work on ecology is the most urgent work to do. And that's where I currently focus my practice. Um, but in particular, it's allowed me to draw boundaries around what it is that that work needs to do. And in particular, for me, um, I have this phrase that goes on around my head a lot, which is the work needs to work, or the work needs to do the work. To make work about ecology, to, to, to make artworks about ecology, um, it doesn't, it, it's not representative anymore. It's not simply about telling stories. It's certainly not about trying to convey facts. Uh, we already know everything we need to know. Um, rather, we need to do the work. And so the work that I'm currently concerned with is, is work that actually is engaged with these processes very directly, whether that's working with um, to construct new forms of solar panel, whether that's uh, new forms of agriculture. Um, uh, a current project is working with uh, agricultural projects here in, here in Greece that are actually regenerative in certain ways and use new technologies in novel ways, but acting directly upon the earth. As I say, not representative, but actually doing the work itself, which I think is so important to how we frame these narratives. Uh, with that in mind, I'd like to um, uh, to agree with and, and kind of push a bit further on what Jonas mentioned earlier. That we find ourselves in quite an interesting position here discussing this within the framework of the Onassis um, Foundation, which frankly is far more powerful than any individual artist at this point in um, generating new narratives for climate change uh, because of its unique structure, because of its reliance on the business foundation which funds its operations. I was particularly struck reading a little of this history earlier. I just wanted to mention one line. In, in 2015, this, the Onassis Foundation acquired, uh, the business foundation which funds the arts foundations, um, bought new, two new super tankers, bringing their, their fleet of oil tankers to 20. And the the, the spokesman for the Onassis Foundation said this thing where he said, uh, you know, by, by buying these tankers, these oil tankers, uh, we shall be able to offer even more of the inexhaustible wealth of the sea to the public benefit and cultural projects of the Onassis Foundation. That's what we're doing here. We're offering those cultural benefits, but they're, they're rooted in a narrative of the inexhaustible wealth of the sea, 
which is no longer the case. And, and so we need to supplant that with new narratives. Um, I think you know, the, the role of artists and all arts organizations in the present is to create those new narratives. Um, and those narratives, as I say, are not mere narratives, they're actual actions. A narrative, as Jonas mentioned, of divestment from fossil fuels would be an incredibly powerful one to supplant that narrative of the inexhaustible wealth of the sea. Um, and so I think and I hope that that's the kind of aim for all artists and art organizations in the present is to push for this realignment, not just in what we speak about, uh, but in the actions that we're actively taking and making through our work. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much, James. And uh, we're now moving to Lucia for uh, the last presentation. Lucia, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. And I have a feeling that none of this will be new, having just heard the most inspiring <laughs> presentations. So thank you so much uh, for having me, but and particularly to my co-panelists for sharing this time and space together. Um, my name is Lucia and I work at the Serpentine uh, as a curator of general ecology, which was a project that I conceived in 2018 as an experiment to make a kind of structural change to an organization. I'm thinking here about James's making the work do the work, a structural change uh, to an organization as a kind of prototype, one that would attune it to a more than human world towards environmental justice and balance via the medium of what we spoke about with the sort of deeper and longer term intention to transform how we did it and how we relate it to other organizations. So a kind of um, a sort of, it's, I don't know why I want to put Christopher Nolan at this, some kind of pincer movement around environmental commitment. Um, so some snapshots from general ecology uh, for you here very briefly. Uh, three years ago in 2018, uh, the writer and editor Philippe Ramos and I began uh, by looking at this image and having a conversation about it. There's a tiny puffer fish in the middle of this image that shuffles about moving the sand and makes this fantastic shape. And this is one of the most iconic moments of the uh, liberal propaganda masterpiece in a sense that is, uh, that is the Blue Planet. So biologists and indeed David Attenborough in the Blue Planet described the circle as part of a mating ritual. Uh, we might look at it and think of uh, of art, so of something that is a little bit more than necessary, maybe. I mean, it's arguable whether art is that, but we'll get to that. So we could sort of play around and say this fish is an artist. But to this tiny fish, if we could shrink right into that fish's mind, then surely the shape of this circle is not actually a circle, but a set of movement, a kind of a dance, a sand shuffle, if you like. And from this, uh, Philippa and I developed uh, The Shape of a Circle in the Mind of a Fish, a multi-year research pro uh, project and festival, series of festivals even, that looked at consciousness, intelligence, and language across species by convening artists, anthropologists, theologians, scientists, and many more. And our first instinct there was this uh, sort of subtle shift of perspective from the circle to the dance. And over time, We've devoted the series to chipping away at various anthropocentric assumptions, assumptions such as you need language to communicate, or we know what we mean when we say I, or um, plants are not intelligent, or uh, and so on. And one of the things that emerged out of this is, is something around anthropomorphism, as very often when you say that say, for instance, a forest is capable of generosity, you're accused by material scientists to be anthropomorphizing a forest, but perhaps saying that a forest is capable of generosity is not necessarily to anthropomorphize the forest, but maybe rather to suggest that human generosity could be a complex emergence from a larger and more ancient kind of generosity and here I echo James <laughs> in thinking perhaps when we're talking about networks of information, uh, they are not, uh, they are certainly potentially gateways towards understanding what is sort of predating and out of which we happen to emerge. 
And this project of anthropo de anthropocentering, but perhaps radical anthropomorphizing. I mean, what are the potentials of that radical anthropomorphizing? Something that um, that has already come up today. In fact, the project is not so much to decenter the human as an abstract notion, but to decenter a certain kind of human, a very specific human who built a very specific set of power relations. Uh, relations that, for instance, are obfuscated when we think about the Enlightenment and don't consider how it was directly funded by the extraction, uh, by the enslavement of people and the extraction of uh, minerals on the other side of the world. These two things, the sort of intellectual abstract and the material tangible are the same. They are connected. We tell a different story. And in fact, the project of the Enlightenment was specifically to cleave one could say nature culture, but what I would, uh, I prefer to think of it as the abstraction, the metaphor and material ontology. So to that end, what does it yield to take metaphors really seriously, abstractions really seriously? And I would kind of make a massive kind of hug around the notion of art in a really vast way, art as a form of abstraction, art, poetry, ritual, myth, and so on. What does it yield to take them seriously? So in the case of the last shape of a circle in the mind of a fish, which we subtitled the understory of the understory, we took we tried to take soil seriously and tried to kind of open up uh, through the medium of that abstraction uh, or that metaphor, which is language itself, open up all the things that are held within this sort of thing. So if we think about soil, land, earth, ground and dirt, and if we enter that conversation through those different sort of through the different kind of openings that those different words yield, then we find not so much a biological discourse over here and a political one over here, but rather a stack of interconnected, interdependent politics and biologies. And in that event, in that kind of cosmological mess that was that event, we uh, sort of held together somehow or sort of tried to think together anything from fungi cleaning up toxic waste through to the racialized distribution of toxic dust in Johannesburg, for example. And here, uh, just to cite a book that has emerged out of the last few years that Andres Jaque, Marina Otero, Verzier and I co-edited that tries to bring together a kind of stack of differential perspectives around the more than human. So in this kind of hyper complex, um, hyper sort of inter entangled reality of unequally distributed uh, crisis, we do, uh, in my humble opinion, desperately need a kind of active, complex and plural movement that focuses on environmental justice and balance, one that does the work, uh, one that centers interconnection, systemic, human and more than human mutual responsibilities and implications. And I don't have time to make the case to you today, but I am convinced that art, abstraction, metaphor, imagination, narrative, myth, memory, and the stuff of the world, earth, ground, animals, mountains, plants, bodies, mineral, are actually one and the same. And that art, some kind of art, one that endures in deep time, is an incredible, incredibly practical thing, one that concerns the real world and holds knowledge about it. And I want to actually cite the fact that uh, New Dark Age blew my mind in showing this, how uh, divination was originally about the weather and how the internet was originally a form of divination, right? So how the, the weather, divination and technology and the sort of technology in the sense we mean when we say technology today um, are one and the same in a certain sense. But I wanted to suggest with this idea of like art and abstraction and memory as a, uh, and, um, and myth and oral history and metaphor as a kind of uh, memory palace through deep time that holds this deep time accreted knowledge and learning about our mutual interdependency in a more than human uh, world, that art in this vast hug sense, in the vastest possible sense, may be the most resilient technology that we have ever come up with. Indeed, the oldest instruction manual that we've ever collectively written about the earth, 
And I probably stop there because otherwise we go into God, love and gravity, which I think might take us a bit too long to talk about. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, fantastic. Thank you all for your beautiful and so rich in content and polemic to a great extent contributions. Um, maybe I would start from something that I see as a connecting thread uh, between uh, all the uh, short presentations. And this is, let's say, the way that you all highlighted the importance of uh, rel relationality in climate narratives. Um, we saw how in different talks, for instance, uh, I think, uh, Jonas, you kind of mentioned the connection of uh, uh, the deep past to the deep future. We, you all talked about the connection of uh, the human to the relation of the human to the more than human world, of culture to nature, of course, of uh, technology to ecology, uh, as James was talking about, um, also of the individual to the community. I think it was kind of um, also certain uh, uh, notions came in of course like um, empathy symbiosis also through um Phoebe's, but also Lucia's talk. So I was, um, I was thinking that in a period that there are these attempts about how do you deal, let's say, with, um, with uh, the attempt to, in a way, to restore the climate or to restore the planet, if it is, in a way, relationships that one has to return to, uh, that, that have to be, in a way, to be restored, that have to be rethought, that have to be reimagined, that have to be reconceptualized if I want to use here uh, the verb that uh, James uh, beautifully used about um, technology. Maybe we can talk a bit about why this is important and what, um, how this comes in in your practice and how do you think that this uh, would help? Because it's a difficult question, so I'll just throw myself in there just to uh, say one thing, which is what I've been trying to think about is how to uh, sort of bake that interrelationality at all the levels of the activity that we do, which may have to do with the kind of more than human international inter oh my goodness interrelationality being supported by a sort of more than one institution or more than one discipline form of interrelationality. So what we're working now is more on that kind of uh, organizational network system to try and be as adherent as possible to what we let's say notice uh and so yeah so that that you can think of that interrelationality again as like these different layers or the stack of things it's particularly hard because i uh i i i mostly write which means sitting in a small room about relate and writing about relationality <laughs> while quite clearly not practicing it at all as I kind of lock myself away with words uh words and writing of course which are kind of the exact opposite of the work doing the work like directly mm -hmm. upon the earth um but uh but I, I I agree with you that it's it feels to me that this is this is a part that has to be baked into to some of the practices that we want to invoke um that embody these new narratives and, and, and the way we kind of want to act um, because we, we we have to do it together with others. Uh, we have to do it at, at levels greater than ourselves. Um, and so the way that I think about that in, in my own practice is, is that the kind of projects I'm developing, um, I want to pull as many other people and practices into them as possible uh, to do more collaborative projects or projects that build um, build upon and with the work of others. Uh, so in particular, the, the project that I alluded to in my presentation, a project called Server Farm. Um, this is a project which is bringing together um, a huge number of different discoveries across the sciences to try and make one kind of complete establishment, uh, essentially a, a, an agricultural establishment using plants and microorganisms to replicate uh, the functions of a, of a digital computer. Uh, but in doing so, it's also going to call upon the practices of other artists who've worked with this. So both the scientific research and the fact that artists have then taken the narratives of that scientific research further, um, explored it and kind of instantiated in different ways, and then to bring those practices together, really to acknowledge in art, I think, something that's already acknowledged in the sciences as, as this thing of, of being going an on, ongoing collaborative process of building researches together. I think that's a really valuable thing, actually, to bring into to artistic practices from um, f f something that's often more obvious in, in the sciences, something that, that like it's impossible. 
if we're talking about the kind of art that actually wants to make an impact on the world, uh, which is what we're doing. There's, there's many kinds of arts, uh, but this is the one that we're talking about. And, and if we're talking about this kind of art, then, then, then it has to be done by as many and varied people as possible. And it has to acknowledge its interrelationships in order to make anything of them. Like otherwise we're all just floundering about in the dark. So it's, it's also something that I think we can kind of take, take as read that this is a, a collaborative interrelational effort um, because we're all trying to work on this thing to, what, to whatever ends and however many different ways. If I try to answer in a way, I, I think that uh, the two speakers before me had touched the important uh, points of the, the question, uh, the intermediality, inter um, multi scientificity of, uh, uh, of the work we have to do. Something that goes through the different media and the different sciences and that relates them together. And for me, the construction of the archive is something like uh, this. And that's the one point that has to do with research. The other, the other point has to do with the multiplicity of people involved. But uh, for me, perhaps the more um, important and, and serious way to get in touch with uh, a subject that has multiple uh, levels of uh, comprehension and being able to, to confront with um, is the place. I mean, that if the research project has to do with specific places, uh, as if also with specific subjects that have to do with the places, uh, it is very easy to understand uh, which are uh, the layers with which the place is connected to. And finally, uh, one finds uh, itself uh, connected to multiple layers, even if the place is something very small. I mean that the research that has to do with specific places and with questions that have to do with them connect the vegetal, the geological, the atmospherical, the human and the non-human, the living and the non-living immediately together. Uh, and to, together with that, they connect to history, to biology, uh, to cosmology. Uh, I mean, by that, uh, something... Uh, as what uh, Lucia was referring, uh, Lucia was referring before, uh, the metaphor that becomes reality. Uh, the, the place is the metaphor that can become reality. I'm working a lot on metaphors and I'm uh, taking them uh, as literal. Uh, metaphors are literal. If we understand them literally, we can understand a lot of things. And that's the same with place. To add to that, in relationship to this question of interdependence and interrelationality, I think it's also important to challenge the ecology that we as artists or cultural workers are part of, that the suggestion that as individual artists or cultural workers, we have something meaningful to say or to change in, in the world is, is wrong and is undesirable if it's not fought uh, in a structural alliance uh, with other um, organizations and, and entities. So for me, it, it's, for example, very important to work directly together with, um, with social movements, with unions, with political parties and uh, pan-European platforms, because the meaning of art um, for me manifests when it is tied to a shared struggle uh, across different practices of, of world making. Artists in and of themselves cannot change the world and should not <laughs> change the world in, in, in that sense. So this, this interdependency for me is very important as a, as a back end to, to my practice. So in the case of the Court for Intergenerational Climate Crimes to work with Rada de Souza as a lawyer who has prosecuted several cases related to, to climate crimes, who is uh, tied to a vast network of climate activists and different organizations struggling for climate justice over longer periods of time, who is capable also of bringing in the knowledge to draft new legal frameworks through uh, which we can also challenge the organizations we work with to think uh, beyond the limitations of their own infrastructures. And especially, of course, in relationship to the law and climate justice, that's a major issue that um, at this moment, climate criminals um, uh, basically store their crimes in the future. 
um, because we prosecute people, we prosecute companies for crimes that they have perpetrated in the past or based on evidence of the past in the present. We don't prosecute climate criminals for the damage on unborn human and plant life of the um, uh, human plant life, animal life of the, of the future. So the court, the legal framework that Rada uh, articulated is also specifically aimed at that to, uh, to address or to, let's say, um, to reject the separations between past, present and future, to think of um, comradeship and ancestry and successors across different scales of uh, different scales of time. And I think for, for me, this is where the role of art and culture becomes very important as part of working with existing organizations to learn from, to do the, to do the work, as James said, it means to be allied to, to others across different uh, fields. And at the same time, the role of art can, I think, continues to be to uh, challenge limitations and open uh, conceptions and field of, of action uh, that in existing institutions might sometimes be impossible to think. Um, and if we can't think it, if we can't imagine them, if we can't imagine the prosecution of climate crimes based on the rights of the unborn, um, if we can't imagine it, then we can't enact it. So I think here, the kind of imaginative faculty of arts and cultural work becomes really essential. Yeah, thank you for, for your answers. I kind of um, find it very interesting how through your answers, it became kind of clear that we need a kind of an approach that is in a way transdisciplinary and uh, maybe transnational also, and also if, if I can... I uh, refer here to your talk a little bit, uh, Jonas, in a way transgenerational. So we need to kind of um, bring um, uh, different people from uh, different uh, sectors and also different generations also together in order to uh, provoke change. And perhaps this is also uh, what might help in realizing and facing problems that I guess that uh, are interconnected in the planetary emergency that we are in. Um, I also found important um, uh, the element of uh, place that uh, kind of Phoebe uh, brought in, which is, and, um, and of course, how, let's say, how important is to refer to situatedness in a way, um, how uh, cultural uh, myths, values, beliefs might come in when we talk about narratives. This is also something that we heard from uh, Lucia's talk. And um, there is an interesting relationship once again here between the uh, so-called planetary issue and on the other hand, what is situated and how the two come together and uh, can help um, each other. And um, I wonder if uh, you would like to comment a bit um, on that, if there is a contradiction uh, or uh, if they were complementary. I think Jonas kind of pointed to this already and, and I wanted to emphasize it because it, it really spoke to me. Um, we need to like smash time itself in the way, in the way that we think about this. Um, Jonas put this very, very clearly in, in his talk about uh, intergenerational crimes. But the, the, the very divisions that, that we have in the present of, of how we, how we conceive of our place within those timelines is what's being addressed in his work and the same consideration I think needs to be addressed to the particularities of place and I think that's and I I, I, I don't want to say too much about it but I wanted to say it because I think it is so relevant to the questions of the arts and questions to the structuring of the arts um, which has always historically been centered around the metropolitan center uh, around cultural centers um, which are also you know the industrial centers um, sites of what um, Amitab Ghosh calls in his amazing book, The Great Derangement, the, the, the place in which the future is produced. Ghosh is writing as both a kind of historian of literature and culture and is also a historian of petroculture. And in that book, he really emphasizes the way in which um, our idea of the future to which both culture and industry contribute was, was historically produced in the metropolitan center and then kind of flowed out towards everywhere else, along with a bunch of other stuff uh, like pollution and colonial violence and so on and so forth. Like, and what he emphasizes is that one of the things that the climate crisis has done is it inverted that timeline. I'm not sure whether it's inverted it or just kind of exploded it. So it's just scattered all over the place now. Um, but the one of the things we have to do away with is, is the notion of the center, um, is the notion of, of there being uh, a, a particular 
place uh, that's higher in the hierarchy. But what that returns to all other places is, is their own kind of omni-centrality. Uh, the fact that this, this work can be done anywhere and everywhere. Um, and and, and as, as Phoebe rightly said, it, an attentiveness to place is an incredibly important part of that. But it's also <laughs> in this beautifully layered and networked way through attentiveness to particular places uh, that we that we engage with the issues uh, that are universal. The Caribbean Film Collective refers to it as Rhone, Rhone and Connected, meaning one zone, your own, and simultaneously connected. I think that's indeed the point to, to think of the planetary as, as, um, as specific. Um, and to also, uh, that also helps us to recognize um, it, when it comes to the relationship between place and uh, time, that when the IPCC uh, claims that there is 10 years left to stop uh, an X amount of heating of the planet, that for different places and for different times, that time has already gone by. Uh, Raoul de Souza always emphasizes that uh, climate, the climate crisis began with colonization. The first waves of extinction began with colonization. For some, there was never 10 years left. For others, there is the luxury of 10 years of, um, of, of speculation. Um, for comrades in the Philippines, that's not the case. For comrades that fled the climate-induced war in Syria, because uh, crop failures due to global heating were, of course, a key contribution to the masses of climate refugees, war refugees, and simultaneously climate refugees that emerged from it. So I, I think, indeed, this is a... While we need to emphasize that everything is interconnected, this reality should not be used as a legitimization to suggest that somehow we are all facing the same crisis because some are um, face extinction at, at much more severe and, and real ways than, than others. No, absolutely. But that's, I mean, that's why I had a massive argument about this existential risk studies uh, because of the fact of like this notion of existential risk is presupposing that we're pre-apocalypse when actually the apocalypse, we are not in the same uh, equivalent relationship with time when it comes to whether being pre, post or mid apocalypse. So we're all simultaneously, I mean, co collectively as a planet, we are in all of those different and very differential um, times. It's just an emphat em emphatic agreement. I think our, our, our time is almost over and we should uh, wrap up here, but maybe we can close with a, just one final, uh, final kind of thing. Uh, if everybody would like to answer this shortly, maybe we can um, close by referring what needs to be done most urgently from the side of cultural institutions. If uh, we could say one thing, what this would be, some things we already heard about how um, uh, we institutions would need to react towards, for instance, carbon emissions or um, how we need to kind of make things happen. But uh, maybe we can just uh, close with some thoughts on that. The most important things from, from the respect to the cultural organizations is that they join the struggles of, of, of artists and audiences and indeed of the entire planet in, in what it is that needs to be addressed. For a long time, the arts I, possibly forever, as we think of it, at least in the West, um, the arts have been like embroiled in, and uh, enmeshed with uh, structures of capital that are utterly destructive. Um, how we escape from those is is tricky and hard, but um, with the same goals of um, reducing our carbon emissions and a bunch of other much more serious and structural things we need to do urgently in the present. Uh, the divestment from, from all forms of fossil fuel and the, the transfer as part of that of power from these centralized institutions to much, much broader and diverse first bodies of artists and then bodies of publics is, is, is undeniable. And if we're not actively working towards that, then we're not talking about anything here. That has to be not just enacted, it also has to be said loudly and clearly uh, and so that any diversion from it can be identified as a distraction and a diversion from that 
Um, so it requires both clear public statements on the behalf of artistic organizations, arts organizations, um, that can then be supported and worked through uh, kind of by artists themselves. I agree, of course, with everything that James has uh, said. I think maybe as an addition that art institutions, of course, themselves, as much as artists, are also products of um, dominant structures of, of power. Um, they might, as James also pointed out earlier, have more agency than artists in certain on certain part, on infrastructural part, but that agency is still relative to the forces that allow it to exist in the first place, the political and economic actors that allow it to exist in the first place. So I think what, what needs to be fundamentally changed or what needs to be fundamentally dismantled is the paradigm of racial capitalism um, that produces the logic of the art institution and many other semi-public or public institutions that, that under which we are ungoverned and in, under which our common futures are being unmade. Uh, and that I think means to for artists and for cultural workers and for um, institutions that support emancipatory politics to insist on the on alternate imaginaries that agitate and mobilize us to be able to think and act a world differently but simultaneously to structurally organize uh, and partake in a political struggle to change uh, hegemonies and control over our public institutions because um, divestment, as long as there is um, uh, fossil capital in, in, in the earth, um, stopping its extraction will not go without, without, a, real, without a real fight, uh, without a real struggle over, uh, over power and over a different idea of power, a different idea of emancipatory uh, governance that doesn't reproduce the predatory and extractive logics that have brought us to uh, the futureless future that we're that we're facing now. Lucia and Phoebe, any last thoughts? Me, I I sign everything that the two previous uh, speakers have said before. I am totally I I agree totally. And with, I don't, I don't want to add anything else. Thank you, James and Jonas. Yeah, it's, I mean, obviously, same. I also have like a kind of perhaps unfounded, time will tell, but sort of quite um, strong, uh, I suppose, faith in uh, forms of, I, I'm going to say, seduction, leverage, and manipulation, <laughs> like forms of internal parasitical transformation. And I'm quite interested in what happens when you get kind of alliances between uh, internal parasitical forces of transformation within any kind of institution or organization, with, within any structure even, and those forces that demand, demand accountability and, uh, and what happens when those two things are kind of working perhaps not in direct relationship with one another, because sometimes there are like practical reasons why you need to keep a certain kind of distance, but I like the sort of distance and magnetically connected uh, emergence that can come out of those, those potentials. And I think, um, what do we, I think it, it's, I, I sound a lot less critical than kind of uh, like, it's, I don't want to sound like an inspirational speaker, but I think there's like something really powerful that happens when an organization starts to feel like it has a different sense of purpose. That doesn't do away necessarily with whatever sense of purpose it wants to have or needs to have uh, in order to continue to, to sort of sustain itself. But I think most institutions use the terms resilience and sustainability, actually meaning their own resilience and their own sustainability. And all of a sudden, when you sort of have have a sense of purpose that includes other um, other things. It it's it's actually quite. Um, it can lead to quite. Uh, hopefully, fingers crossed to quite transformative. Um, I keep saying emergences, <laughs> emergences. <laughs> Thank you, Lucia. I think this is also a very nice ending of how seeing an institution changing the purpose can also influence in a way narratives that can operate on a societal change uh, level, let's say. 
Um, I would like to warmly thank you all, Lucia, James, Phoebe, and Jonas. And um, a big uh, thank you to Onassis Tegi for inviting us all to be part of uh, climate culture, the art of becoming sustainable. Thank you and goodbye. <laughs>